Hey, there they are. How's my how's my American history part two class doing? It's been a while. It's been actually about three weeks. So when you see this, we won't won't have seen each other since March the 13th, which was uh, that Friday. So I hope you're doing well. And uh, this is this is going to be the the norm as far as uh, my lecture posts. I I actually thought about doing live posts and actually all coming together at, at the same time and all that. I know some professors are doing that, but given the scenarios, given a lot of the upheaval that's taking place, I thought it would probably just be better for me to post these recorded lectures, these Zoom lectures, onto first YouTube and then obviously onto the Converge page, which is what I'll be doing. So um, just Look for these according to the, the updated course calendar, the online learning calendar, the remote learning calendar, whatever we're supposed to call it these days. And you'll see that these Zoom lectures will be there. I will also typically post a couple of links that are associated with my Zoom lecture, in this case, for today. So when you access this uh, for Friday, just be looking for a couple of uh, video links primarily dealing with how 1950s culture is often represented. So a clip from Ozzie and Harriet, a clip from Leave it to Beaver, and actually a, uh, a clip that deals with, um, sorry, hold on just a second. There we go. My computer's being a little fun here. So a, a clip that also deals with a film called Pleasantville from 1998. That, that essentially um, kind of parodied the 1950s, uh, Tobey Maguire, Reese Witherspoon, and some other, some other really good actors and actresses in that film, actually. Um, so I, I'm gonna post a couple of those clips, and I, I think they're interesting representations of the 1950s. So again, folks, I hope you're doing well. Uh, I miss seeing you. I, I wish we could be in our class together, uh, you know, just like normal and, and interact that way. That's obviously, for me anyway, that's my preference. But we're gonna make this, this whole process work as well as we can and, and we'll carry that forward. Just so you know, I obviously, you took an exam uh, on Wednesday and I will be going through those I, I will tell you this process of converting everything I do into an online learning format of some sort is, is taxing and extremely time consuming. Everything that I normally do now takes like three, four times longer, uh, you know, communicating with fellow professors or my department chair and everything is taking a lot longer. So I, I just, uh, I want you to know I will probably have those exam two scores posted within the next 10 days or so. That is my hope. Um, I'm also, I have a writing deadline that I'm dealing with that that's also, of course, coming to, coming to the forefront in the midst of all this chaos. So um, I'm staying really busy. I, I, I want you to know I'm not sitting in my house and and uh, sleeping and, and watching movies. Uh, my cat is over here sleeping. She's sitting on our couch right here, sleeping as I talk. My uh, nearly 19 year old cat, her name is Misty. By the way, so I, I'm, uh, I told my history of film class in a lecture that I did for them earlier. Uh, we're going with Casual Friday uh, today and I'm, I'm resurrecting my, uh, my high school nickname in, in uh, through my, my flash, here we go, my flash superhero t-shirt. I, I hope you guys can handle that. Uh, so no, no bow ties this afternoon, I'm afraid. Um, but I did shave for you. So uh, I'm, I'm actually trying to have good hygiene. I just am not wearing my, uh, you know, my, my suits and ties and things along those lines, at least not today. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that again at some point, but uh, not today. So I hope you're doing well. Um, welcome, welcome to my, uh, my family room. I've got, actually don't have to have the fire going today. It's a little bit warmer today than it was, you know, three, four days ago. So I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with my, 
with my fireplace off for the moment. Now, by the way, I have my my uh, Snoopy uh, Flying Ace, you know, versus the Red Baron trusty coffee mug here. I hope that you have a, a similarly wonderful mug of something warm and, and wonderful that you're able to, to sit with as you watch some of these videos. So here's what I want to do. Today is going to be just about a cultural representation of the 1950s. And then on, on uh, Monday, April 6th, so uh, a few days from now, on Monday, the Zoom lecture is actually going to be a, a, um, an explanation, a synthesis explanation of the origins of the American involvement in Southeast Asia, uh, the, the origins of what will ultimately become the Vietnam War in the 1960s and 1970s, because th those origins are really important to understand and they actually begin all the way back in the 1950s. So that is gonna be my, my approach uh, over the next couple of class periods. But today we need to dig into the 1950s. So uh, I want you to look at those links that I posted about uh, you know, representations of the 50s because I think they're very interesting. Uh, you know, the, the representations that you will see in TV shows like uh, The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet and Leave it to Beaver are you know, kind of the, you know, the, the quintessential pop culture representations of the 1950s. You know, the post-World War II generation coming you know, coming into their own in a sense, in a in a very American material sense. The prosperity, the the ostensible prosperity of the 1950s is present as presented as sort of a near universal. So the emergence of not only urban culture but suburban culture. So the suburban or suburb culture is definitely a huge focal point of the 1950s. Uh, so the middle class uh, American families that are on display in in those uh, you know 1950s sitcoms are are often meant to be representations of a larger cultural whole, and there is some truth to those cultural representations. It, it was a, a very different time than it is now, and a lot of uh, middle class families, particularly of course, were referencing white middle class American families of the 1950s. Uh, the the ideal that was prescribed was, of course, a, a very uh, very Judeo Christian ideal in a sense, because it, the ideal was uh, a, a husband and wife, a, a man and woman married, running a household, having their children, uh, instructing them in all matters, uh, you know, moral and financial and educational and religious and a, a reverence for authority, a reverence for doing the right thing. Uh, very, very much what we would probably regard in 2020, what many of us would regard, I suppose, as um, you know, a very, uh, uh, very almost a surreal association with this bygone era. The, the idea that the nuclear family of the 1950s with the father who goes off to work each morning and the wife who stays at home and runs the household uh, and makes the food and does the cleaning and uh, you know all the rest. What many Americans in, in the 2010s here where we live now, many Americans, especially many American women, I would, would probably suspect would regard as rather a, a demeaning representation. So a, a lot of the, the cliched presentations of the 1950s are based on on those sorts of uh, you know visual components those those sorts of um, cultural representations so you know I don't want you to completely dismiss television shows like the the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet and leave it to beaver as mere propaganda I've heard students say that in in previous terms when I've taught and I think that's too dismissive because the reality is that there were a lot of American families who, who thought and, and acted very similarly in many respects to those characters, well, which is why American families uh, you know, were probably attracted to those television shows because they had those connections. They seemed to be like one another. However, you also need to understand that 
although I would not necessarily use the term propaganda, I would say that shows like Leave It, Leave it to Beaver and Ozzy and Harriet and others, that they definitely have their limitations because they are, uh, they are honing in on, on a particular sector of American society. And it's not inclusive of a lot of other different parts of American society. Certainly there were American families who were even more prosperous, who would not have been in the American, the emerging American middle class. Uh, and there were also plenty of Americans, especially American minorities, uh, black Americans in particular, who were still uh, wading through the harsh realities of racism in the post-World War II era, stretching from the end of the war in 1945 on through to the, the surge and the beginning of of legitimate and powerful civil rights campaigns in, in the late 50s and on through the, the great civil rights era of the 1960s. So many of those Americans, many black Americans, uh, were not experiencing life like uh, you know, the families portrayed in television shows like Leave it to Beaver. You also need to understand, and something I'm gonna frame for you here in a few minutes, uh, uh, is that a lot of 1950s culture should be understood through the lens of the Cold War. And we've, you guys have already learned a little bit about the origins of the Cold War and guys like George F. Kennan and the Truman Doctrine and containment and you know, things along those lines. Um, keep in mind that, that that is also part of American culture, even though that may be a global issue and uh, the, the idea of the American, uh, the, the Western powers, America, Britain, France, its allies, and NATO, for instance, that those countries were, were waging a cultural war against the Soviet Union and all of its allies in places like the Eastern European bloc countries. So that is part of this as well, uh, the, the anti-communist culture, the, there's an anti-communist cultural element that I'll be dealing with in just a few minutes with McCarthyism. So there are a lot of interesting components that are in play in the 1950s, and they do not all align with the, uh, you, you know, with that leave it to beaver mentality. Um, it's, it's interesting if, I mean, if you were to talk to your, your grandparents, uh, in my case, it's, it's my own parents and, and my my grandparents would be like your great grandparents and whatnot. But uh, if we talk to our earlier generations, I think you would find if you, uh, you know, if you happen to be uh, from a white middle, from a uh, a household with with um, you know parents and grandparents who were white middle class Americans in the 1950s, I think you'd find that a lot of them would say, yeah, you know, actually. Uh, the Leave it to Beaver, it may be overplaying its hand here and there and maybe exaggerating some things, but actually the layout is similar to the patterns of life that, that we experience too. I, I think the real problem, as I said, is that we have to consider a broader representation when we're talking about actual American culture. Okay, so let's dig into some of this. Foreign relations and war. So through the lens of the Cold War, I want you to be aware of a couple of different events in the 1950s uh, that, that certainly stand out. The first of which is called the Suez Crisis. And I want you, it's, it, it's definitely in the Yop text that you guys are reading, but I also want you to just take a couple of extra notes on this. So 1956, we're halfway through the decade when I'm mentioning this crisis, and there, there are some reasons for this. I want to deal with the, the Eisenhower years. President Dwight David Eisenhower is president from 19, takes office in 1953, and he leaves office in 1961 when John Kennedy takes, takes office. And so these are often termed to, to be the Eisenhower years. Eisenhower being the commanding general of allied forces in Europe during World War II. And, um, and through the lens of Eisenhower and the Cold War, there's, a there's an increased reliance in the United States on trying to kind of uh, tone down some of the, the rhetoric, the anti-communist rhetoric, and perhaps find ways to improve U.S.-Soviet relations. This is a perfect example of how Eisenhower, the former military commander, obviously understood the importance of, of trying to find some degree of balance in, in international 
military and diplomatic relations. Uh, and so that, that's a, a background to this. What happens in 1956 is a, an Egyptian leader named Gamal Abdel Nasser is his name. I lo love some of these Middle Eastern names that are that you just kind of have to get used to, right? After a while, they're, they're a little bit easier to remember. But Nasser decides in, in 56 that he's going to claim the right to the Suez Canal, that he's essentially going to nationalize for Egypt, the Suez Canal. Now you understand that the Suez Canal is of major importance to all sorts of countries as far as a, a waterway for transportation, both, um, you know, both for civilian purposes, but also for military purposes. And so the seizure of the canal was a big deal. There's this huge crisis that blows up, right? And the, the British and the French and Israeli forces, uh, you know, Israel's a, a brand new country created in 1947 after the Second World War, and it has already at that, this point in 56, Israel's already been on, you know, kind of, kind of a, a rotating basis of fighting off enemies in the Middle East, enemies that did not want Israel to exist, including Egypt. So when this happens, uh, the British, the French, the Israelis uh, go through repeated operations to try to take the canal back. Uh, some of them are just embarrassingly inept. And it's, it's an interesting moment for us in this sense. Britain, as probably our chief ally, is begging the United States to come in on the side of the British and the French and, and the Israelis as well. Uh, they're, they're begging the U.S. to take a stance, right, and come in on the side of these Western allies and help to retake Suez. And, and Eisenhower decides on a, a different course entirely, and he decides that the United States is going to stand pat and it will not intervene, it will not be a part of this particular enterprise. And that proves to be a very important moment because uh, the uh, the Cold War, although the United States and the Soviets hadn't actually been unleashing its, their military might on one another, the the tensions were were very high from 1947 on through 1953 and 54, and and so this was a a moment where there at least seemed to be the possibility that the United States and the Soviets were going to soften some of those tensions, uh, and. And you know there there wasn't immediate resolution. Ultimately, the Suez Canal was reopened to international traffic, but the Soviets obviously supported Egypt's right to the canal, and so there's kind of this multinational agreement that's ultimately put in place. But it, it's a high a high tension moment regarding foreign relations. The other thing I want you to be aware of is is this. So Sputnik, October of 1957. Sputnik is um, very small by modern standards. Uh, the, the Sputnik satellite, uh, we probably, you know, other than the, the tentacle looking apparatus that, you know, spreads out from, from the sides on, on the Sputnik satellite, it's actually very small. Um, it, it probably would, would fit into this corner of my, of my family room here over by my television set. Um, but it has an immense impact on global culture and certainly American culture. The, the race to, if we want to call it own, quote unquote own space, was on by, you know, 1950 and 52. The race to be the first, you know, nation to put, um, you know, space capsules up into the upper stratosphere to actually get human beings up into space as well. This is an, you know, essential battle of the Cold War. And the Soviets were hard at work, as were the United, as was the United States, but Britain as well, in trying to be the pioneers here. And the Soviets beat everyone to it, putting Sputnik up into space in October of 1957. And famously, um, you could hear a, a you know from a, a radio frequency, you could actually hear the the little blip as Sputnik passed by overhead. It's very difficult; you wouldn't have been able to see Sputnik with the naked eye; it was too small. But nonetheless, this was a very destabilizing, unsettling moment when, when Americans, when all Westerners were informed that of all people, the Soviets were the first to put their 
there's space technology in play and to have this satellite orbiting the earth in 1957. Very important moment that I wanted you to be aware of. Another very critical moment that actually will play out for us in the 1960s. So for some of you who've already done your, uh, your Bridge of Spies film review, you've seen part of this, the Francis Gary Powers moment in the film where he was, he was shot down, his U-2 spy plane was shot down during a voyage over Soviet Russia. The, the timing of this is really another critical element. You'll see here it's May the 1st, 1960. And uh, Eisenhower's president, there was supposed to be a summit, a, a, a diplomatic meeting between Eisenhower and the Soviet premier Nikita Khrushchev. And they were both preparing for that summit. And the concern was the nuclear weapons arsenal, uh, the, the, the idea that maybe the, the nuclear weapons of the United States and the Soviets were kind of getting a little bit out of control. And, and there was the hope that maybe those, uh, those nuclear arsenals could be toned down. Uh, there was also a possibility of some, some different strategic weapons discussions to be taking place at this meeting. But of course, uh, you know, meetings of that kind require some element of trust. And both the Soviets and the Americans had been engaging in overflights, uh, which is to say, uh, trying to, to, to spy on their enemies as much as that was possible. The Soviets were not able to fly over, you know, the vast majority of the United States proper, you know, geographically speaking. But they, there were some U.S. bases that Soviets, Soviet spy planes, Soviet uh, spies and spy equipment were, were, you, were uh, focusing on and sending information back to, to Moscow with. But uh, there were rumors that the United States had been flying illegally over the Soviet Union with, uh, with spy planes and also over in, uh, military installations in places like Turkey. And so the United States uh, decides, uh, Eisenhower tells Khrushchev, no, those, you know, I, those, those rumors are untrue. He said, we're abiding by our commitments, by our treaties, and we are not engaging in these overflights. Um, you know, th that is false information. Unbeknownst to Eisenhower and the US, the Russian missile, missile systems um, over the Ural mountain chain and extending out to Moscow were actually quite advanced. And the United States was, under, uh, the US uh, commanders were under the impression that a spy plane like the U-2 was, was going to be able to operate uh, without the danger of being shot down by, uh, by anti-aircraft batteries. Uh, believing that you know its top ceiling of about 70,000, 75,000 feet would keep it safe at that altitude. Unfortunately, they found out the hard way that that wasn't true. So Francis Gary Powers is shot down, making an illegal overflight of the Soviet Union in May of 1960. And after this happens, uh, actually Khrushchev uh, sends a, a personal communique to President Eisenhower, and he says, you know, can you tell me, what, what can you tell me essentially about, you know, once again, about this claim that United States pilots, Air Force pilots are not flying over the Soviet Union and engaging in illegal spy activities. And Eisenhower st stuck to his claim, stuck to his guns and said, no, that's not true. And then of course the Soviets trotted out this captured pilot, Francis Gary Powers, for, for an international court, uh, um, for, for the international community to see, I should say. It wasn't an international court, it was a Soviet court. And he's, he's put on trial. And it, it was an unbelievable embarrassment for the United States, for Eisenhower. Uh, and, and the Soviets relished the opportunity to rub our noses in a lie. And it also destabilized relations that had seemed to, at that point, seemed to have been improving. And, and there's this, you know, the idea that the Cold War is thawing and, and maybe the, the relations for, between the U.S. and the Soviets are going to improve. But this incident uh, 
you know, throws a monkey wrench into all of that and actually begins this process of uh, increased escalation. So a really critical moment I want you to be aware of. It's technically 1960, but it's at the tail end of the 1950s, and I wanted you to be aware of it. Again, on Monday the 6th, I'm going to be walking you through the buildup to Vietnam, so I'm not going to go into that right now. But that is also a part of the 1950s that we'll be talking about. Race relations and civil rights in the 1950s, really critical. So things that, that television shows like I Love Lucy and Ozzie and Harriet and Leave it to Beaver and, and whatnot, that they're, they're certainly not focusing a whole lot on these more controversial cultural issues. So the, the civil rights era is sometimes noted as like 1957 on through you know, most of the 1960s and beyond really, but uh, kind of the uh, the burgeoning of the civil rights movement and, and all the, the famous acts like the, the Civil Rights Act of 64 and 65, those things come later. But really, I, I think the one of the most critical moments is, is happening all the way back here in 1954. So this is before the Montgomery bus boycott. It's before all of those things. It's all the way back in 1954. It is the, the crucial test case. And uh, in a very surprising decision in, in 54, the US Supreme Court struck down a, uh, a precedent that had been in place since 1896. Excuse me, I have to have some of my, my delicious coffee here. It's a really wonderful hazelnut, I might add. So if you like coffee, I would recommend a good hazelnut every now and again. Sorry, my throat is dry. You guys will have to forgive me. So the, the 54 Supreme Court decision is critical because what it does is it reverses the precedent set back in 1896 with a, a, a court case called the Plessy v. Ferguson case, which is, had essentially put in play uh, the, the segregation system. The whole idea, or it had ratified in a sense, uh, given this legal rationale to segregation by saying essentially that it was perfectly constitutional to abide by facilities that were separate if they were somehow equal, which never really was the case in just about every scenario we can imagine. You, you would not have found in the 1940s and 50s if you were traveling, especially in the Deep South, that um, whether it was a train car or a bathroom, you would not have found that those facilities were anywhere close to the same for a white person versus a black American. Uh, they were inherently unequal, which is exactly what this court case says. Uh, in one of the famous declarations in the Brown v. Board case, the Supreme Court says that, you can read that on the, the paper here, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities, it says, famously are inherently unequal. And what, what we see here is the process of integration in education and the integration of schools kicks off uh, you know, implications across the board. Because what happens, of course, is, is that um, Black American children are now given access rights to attend schools with white children. And so there's the integration of the school systems, but this also means depending on where those children are gonna be going to, where those, those black children are now gonna be going to school, that also affects oftentimes where their family has been living versus where they will live moving forward. And so it kicks off, you know, the, the 1954 Brown v. Board decision actually kicks off this era of incremental gradual integration. Um, uh, primarily, of course, we're talking about Black Americans uh, integrating more and more into white American communities, and it actually begins with this educational process. It's a very important case, uh, and I, I've had you guys read about some of the, some of the civil rights elements through the primary source documents in the American YAWP text. This is definitely one of the most important. The Montgomery bus boycott, famously, of course, right? We've got a great picture here with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. in the background. 
and Rosa Parks in the foreground here in this picture on the left. And uh, the bus here, uh, the, the famous bus that all this took, took place in. So famously, of course, as I, I suspect most of you know this, so I'm not telling you anything new, but Rosa Parks is responsible for, for being one of these, these courageous everyday Americans, black Americans, who decides that the, the rules, the, uh, you know, the segregation rules uh, are, do not have merit, that they do not align with what we prescribe as an American ideal. And when asked to leave a part of the bus that was ostens that was reserved for white passengers, Rosa Parks refused to do so. And she was arrested and it kicks off this huge boycott. And this is important because of Rosa Parks herself, because that is a very courageous and and, and probably uh, you know an act of defiance that uh, that I don't know that we can fully appreciate in our own time, but but there were all sorts of of repercussions, all sorts of possible repercussions, and so this is this is definitely an act that takes place through a, this contextual lens of uh, of laws and regulations that are have been rationalized as perfectly acceptable and good in a society that claims to uh, to embrace equality and freedom and yet denies equality and freedom to an entire aspect of its population. All of these things had been normalized in American society for so long that acts like this, conscientious, courageous acts like this were just too few and far between. But of course, she, she really ends up sort of starting an avalanche here, right? With this with this little uh, snowball that becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and it gets national attention. And, uh, you know, leaders like Martin Luther King Jr., Medgar Evers, there are others, they, they begin to, uh, you know, I think gain strength and, uh, you know, a unifying nature through, you know, watching these kinds of courageous acts happen. So the Montgomery bus boycott is another criti absolutely critical moment. Uh, that is occurring in the 1950s that certainly would not seem to be a a part of normal, if we want to call it that, normal reality for many white middle class Americans, especially those in the Midwest and the Northeast and Western Northwestern parts of the country. Uh, and yet, uh, these things are definitely happening. They're shaping American culture in important ways. So the integration process that I just talked about a minute ago, the integration of places like Little Rock, uh, the Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, famous photo here happening in September of 1957. Uh, all of these things are, are happening in, in kind of succession and you see that they're, they're often uh, kind of building on one another. So this is the same year as the Montgomery bus boycott. We see that, that even the integration process is is having to be done forcefully because people, not only in the Deep South, there were people, uh, you know, there were superintendents in schools in, in some parts of the Midwest, like Kentucky comes to mind, Northwestern Kentucky, Ohio, Illinois as well. Uh, there were, you know, bits and pieces of this that were all over the place, but it was more prominent in the Deep South where you'd have governors who refused the integration order. And, and what this meant was, you know, you'd have these uh, these citizens standing outside of these schools, railing against the the black American, the young the young black American boys and girls who were being integrated and trying to just get into their school and go to their classroom. They actually had to be escorted by National Guard troops, and this happened here in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, just a phenomenally important moment in the history of our culture as we think about the difference between the prescribed ideal of equality and freedom versus the lack of those things being supplied, being offered to an entire group of Americans simply because of their skin color. Okay, domestic politics and culture. McCarthyism, so back to the Cold War in a sense. 
Uh, Senator McCarthy, the, the famous notion of McCarthyism is, is based on the idea that, uh, that the Soviet Union, that its precepts, uh, that, that everything the United States is fighting against has actually infiltrated our own culture. And Senator McCarthy from Wisconsin builds these based on hearsay, based on false evidence, based on uh, actually just an outlandish sense of uh, an outlandish sense in his mind that Americans will will align with him simply based on fear. McCarthy begins to construct these these fantasy stories uh, in most cases. All right, so McCarthy. There are a couple of actually, there are a couple of people that had previously been identified by the Justice Department as um, as those working for the communist cause to infiltrate our culture, but they had already been um, they'd been made aware of this. Our, our government had been made aware of this. There were also already some pending charges. There were already a couple of spy cases that had come to the forefront. So McCarthy is basically using some legitimate uh, justice cases that were pending at the time. He's using those as fodder. He's using those as kind of firepower to construct this broader fantasy narrative that many parts of American government and, and even the entertainment community that these places had been infiltrated by Soviet communism and that members of our own government and parts of our society were functioning agents of Soviet style communism. And uh, it's just, it's one of the most embarrassing things that, that way too many people, simply probably because McCarthy was, you know, was a senator at the time, there was at least a, a little bit more uh, of, a, of a positive association with American politics than there is today. So there were way too many Americans that somehow bought into McCarthy's stories that he built and it became a legitimate problem for a while in our country until, of course, McCarthy was in fact proved to be um, using this whole situation for his own political gain and that he had in fact uh, faked a lot of the stories that he'd been bringing to the forefront and just kind of invented them out of nothing. Really embarrassing, horrible moment in American history. Okay, um, oops, sorry guys. So here's what I would say. Um, on Monday, I want you guys to be, uh, to be ready to go through the rest of uh, the 1950s, but I'm gonna do that through the lens of Vietnam. So that's, like I said, that's where I'm gonna focus my time. So that's where we're going on Monday. Um, again, I will be getting some grading done on your exams, but they will not be back to you until probably the earliest, um, I would say is gonna be after, maybe if we're lucky by next Friday, but I'm not gonna promise that. It may not be until right after the Easter, uh, you know, the Easter weekend, Easter Sunday, even though I suspect most of us will not, all of us will not be, not be going to any Easter Sunday services at our churches. Um, so I'll either have those exams graded by Friday um, the 10th or, or perhaps Monday the 13th. Anyway, okay, thanks guys. Thanks for being with me here. And uh, I'll, I'll keep taking your submissions for the film reviews and things. And I hope you're doing well and, and know that I'm continuing to pray for you and uh, certainly miss seeing you. So I hope you're really well and, and hopefully we'll have a chance to reconnect uh, that may be in the fall. <laughs> we may, may have to wait until then, but uh, it will happen at some point. Have a good rest of your day. See ya.